never gives up, it never runs out. Save the wretch like me. 
what a savior we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, who did love us so fully, so completely, that he did lay down his life for us. God, as we come into worship this morning, we give you thanks and praise for your love towards us in Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we worship today, that you would move in us, that you would move among us, that you would move through worship and word and song and prayer, that we would be moved toward you. God, help us to fully be present to you during this time. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship. It is good to be here with all of you, those gathered here in person, those of you who are joining us online. My name is Melissa Danielson. I'm the associate pastor here at the church, and Don introduced himself earlier today. Uh, we're delighted to have him here with us today. Our senior pastor, Bill, is away this week, um, but we are in good hands, so we are looking forward to that message. Um, a few announcements as we begin our time of worship together. First, I want to um, let you know that our sanctuary renovation project is set to begin on Monday, June 26th. So we will be worshiping in the sanctuary through June 25th. And then for the first three Sundays in July, we are planning for our this service, our contemporary service, to be earlier when it's cooler, outside at Forker Field um, at 9.15. So we're going to flip-flop for those three weeks, July 2nd, July 9th, and July 16th. Our classic service will be in Fellowship Hall those Sundays um, at 10.45. So just so you can start doing the mental planning and preparing for arising a little earlier and bringing a chair with you and just um, also we hope that you'll invite neighbors and friends outdoor worship is a great opportunity to invite people who might not be comfortable in this kind of space to experience worship with us in a space that is more familiar to them so we hope that you'll be thinking and praying strategically about who is God asking and prompting you to invite to bring along with you to those services Next, we want to let you know that we are doing a summer series called Faith in Film. We're going to be showing a movie each month through the summer. And our first one is going to be The Case for Christ on Thursday, June 22nd at 7 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. Um, there's more information about this in your Friday email. But the idea here is that we'll gather to watch a film together. And then if you are the kind of like like to talk about a movie afterwards type person will be hanging out for a little bit. If you're not, you can just leave and be like, that was fun. Um, and the idea, though, is that we're picking films that we think have something to say about the life of faith or something to challenge or encourage or inspire us about faith. So having a little bit of time to talk about that, it's also a great way, um, opportunity to invite some friends. So we hope that you'll join us for that. Um, I also want to, on behalf of the missions committee, thank everyone for your generosity um, and giving regularly because it really matters. Um, this past week, our missions committee was able to send an additional $500 to one of our mission partners, Yasir, who was in Sudan running um, a school and a camp and um, basically doing mission work secretly <laughs> in a part of Sudan where it can be very risky. However, due to the conflict in that country, he and his family had to leave. They are basically now refugees. Um, they did arrive safely in Egypt, but are obviously their lives have been turned over and we're waiting to hear more about that. But this gift will kind of help them in part of this transition time. Um, so your gifts really matter because it allows us to do things like this, kind of support people, not just locally, but also globally who are experiencing firsthand crisis um, as they are also seeking to follow Jesus. And that just leads me to say thank you um, for your continued faithfulness in giving. While we don't pass the plate here in worship um, as we used to do, your, your regular giving, your tithes and offerings are an act of worship, 
Um, they are a way of acknowledging that everything we have comes from God, and we give a part of that back as an acknowledgement that we are fully and always, not just spiritually, but physically, emotionally, everything dependent on God. And we seek to steward those gifts really well um, to make sure that the gospel is proclaimed both locally and around the world. And so thank you. If you brought your gift with you today, you can go in the new spot in the box on the wall out there, but you can also give online um, or through um, the text. And then finally, because <laughs> we do actually have a lot of things going on this summer, we really, really encourage you to try the Connect card. Um, you just text the word Connect to the church number there, and then you get a link, and you click on the link, and the link opens up something that looks like that. You just fill in that information, and then there are some drop-down menus where it says, I'm interested in, or sign me up for. If you hit those, there's different things you can sign up for, things like helping out with the July 4th, the summer read group, the hiking clubs, things like that. Um, and you can also share any praises or prayers. We'd love to hear from you um, about something great that's been going on in your week. Um, or about a way, a particular need that you might want to share with us, and we would look forward to following up with you on that. So summer is not really a super quiet time here, <laughs> which is a good thing, but we hope that you'll look for ways to serve, connect, and stay involved through the summer months. And at this time, I'm going to invite Luke come up to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Melissa. Um, while we are out at Forker Field Stadium for our service, I did hear rumor that Pastor Bill will be entering the stadium through a football tunnel into one of those things that you jump through, and that's with confetti. That's the rumor I heard, so if that doesn't happen, I, I don't know what to tell you, but we do encourage you to, to attend those um, as we fix up our sanctuary. I, uh, I spent my undergraduate years at Wheaton College, which is a small private Christian school, uh, like Grove City College, minus the new up-and-coming Chick-fil-A, so very similar, and one of the, um, one of the subtexts, if you ask many of the students there, um, one of the underlying themes that a lot of students have felt is that they were the only ones that felt like they didn't measure up, that they were the only ones that were struggling with a particular sin or a particular class, or they're the only ones that were just trying to stay afloat, everyone else was doing fine, everyone else had it all together. And uh, I've talked with students here who feel that way. I've talked to people within our church who feel that way, that they are the ones that are struggling. Everyone else is doing fine. Um, but the reality is that's not the case, right? And as we enter into a time of prayer, I can't help but think that uh, the college students, if there was more a culture of confessing of sins among friends, if there's more of a culture of telling each other how they need to, or how they've not measured up. If there's more of that, then I think there'd be more of reality of we are all, all equally in need of encouragement, in need of prayer, and in need of forgiveness of sins. And so it's encouragement to me, it's encouragement to you to remind ourselves that it is important to confess our sins. It is important to remind ourselves that we are in need of a Savior, all of us. And so that's part of why we do have a confession of sins together as a congregation. And so we're going to read that together from the screen and then from that into a time of personal confession with God and from that into the Lord's Prayer. So would you join me in reading together? Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are our God and that you have established your covenant of grace with us in the firm foundation laid for our faith at the cross and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
We give you thanks that we are adopted children of you through your son and that in him we are heirs of eternal life and all the blessings of heavenly life in communion with you. We thank you for the promises of your word which are secure for us in Christ having been purchased for us by his blood and that a new and living way has been everlastingly opened for us in and through him who is our life and our hope and our delight. And so because of your great love for us, we ask that you would help us to know and love each other as well. Help us to see and honor, deepen our spirits, those in our community. Teach us to love with the same exuberance which you love them. Bind us together in the household of faith and the church universal. God, where there is disunity, we ask that you would bring reconciliation Where there is violence, bring peace. Where there is fear, bring comfort and encouragement. Where there is illness, bring healing. Where there is death, bring hope in life everlasting. And help us trust in your guiding presence at all times. We ask that you would open our hearts and fill us with respect for your word, for your church, for your people. Let our hearts be filled with awe of you and our actions filled with conviction and care. We lift these things in the powerful and true name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. I want to invite Dr. Don Opitz with us today. We're excited to hear from you. Thanks, Luke. All right, friends, I'm going to start out um, this morning with a, um, a quick round of Name That Tune. All right, so um, you're going to have to put put your brain in the Wayback Machine because this goes all the way back to the sweet sounds of 1975. So that's unfair, isn't it? Because some of you weren't alive in 75. Um, I thought that this would be like a no-brainer for the the earlier service because truth is there's some older people there in that cert that were st- alive and well in 75 and listening to to music but here here you go your job is going to be the na- to name the artist because i'm going to tell you right out of the gate that the title of the song is it's a miracle and it goes like this it's a miracle a true blue spectacle a miracle comes true oh and you know that the miracle is you in the end, so it's very lovely. And who was the artist that sang that wonderful song? Let's hear it. Come on, God, seriously. It's a miracle. Barry Man, was that Balcony? Yes, thank you very much. Now this morning, just so you know this, in this morning's service, One person finally did get it, but she hid her head down under the pew and kind of set it down into the floor, but I heard it. So um, just so you know, Barry Manlow, one of my mom's favorite artists. Yeah, sure, she's 90, but um, (laughs) so, hey, but get, get this though. You know this, right? Technically, love isn't a miracle, right? It's a battlefield. Um... But that's a whole nother sermon, and that's Pat Benatar. That's, we're not playing Name That Tune anymore. Okay. Hey, if ever I hit a hole-in-one, it'll be a miracle. Okay? We use the word miracle like that a lot. Something that is unexpected, something that's strange or rare, we'd say that that's a miracle. Technically, that's not a miracle. It would just be, um, it would be lovely. It would be a, t- a day of celebration. More precisely, a miracle is the suspension of the um, kind of the normal laws of nature or the laws of time. Something out of the ordinary that happens, but we can do better than that kind of dusty definition. A little more theologically, it's the inbreaking of divine revelation, divine care, divine action, right? And so for us, if God is, and if God acts, 
and if God cares, then for us, maybe miracle isn't that big of a problem. We're like, yeah, of course, I've read the Bible and I've seen miracles from beginning to end, from creation in the Exodus account, throughout the, uh, throughout the prophets, um, through the life and teaching. In fact, the coming of Jesus in the incarnation, what we celebrate at Christmas and Easter, miracles. So miracles is part of our, you know, kind of our faith story. So maybe not that big of a surprise, not something that really troubles us. Maybe it doesn't even belong on a list for our series on hard to believe because you say, already believe it. But if, um, if somehow by some intervention of the Lord, some miracle was to happen right here in our service in the midst of us, it would produce all kinds of confounded confusion and wonder and multiple explanations. What is this thing that has happened here? Do I really have space in my mind and in my heart to embrace the miraculous? It's so unusual for us. Many of us here would say, that, yeah, that maybe we've never actually witnessed. We've, we've had some spectacular um, spectacular work of God's spirit in our life, but mostly explainable. Um, but for something miraculous to happen, that'd be surprising. Just so you know, though, culture after culture around the world, the experience of miracles is a little different. The house church movement in China, for example, 90% of the people who are in the house church movement claim that the reason why they're in it is because they've either experienced or witnessed a miracle. Okay, so wait, that's, a, that's culturally a huge shift in a different direction. Um, that's true in, um, in Nepal as well. 80% of the converts in Nepal, um, they claim that their faith began either with the experience of or witnessing of a miracle. Okay, so we've got some interesting things to work on here today, even if you think, uh, you know, generally like, no, I'm okay that, with miracles. Many people are okay with miracles as long as they were long ago and far away in the Bible. But as it gets a little closer to home, it's uh, troubling. It's a little, it's a little concerning to us. Um, for us, the well of wonder has gone dry. So um, we're going to explore this a little bit. Now, this series, hard to believe, we've been working on apologetics, the defense of the faith, the effort to employ evidences and argumentation to show either that there is a God, so arguments for the existence of God could be part of that. That's a whole field of study. Um, of the uh, reality of the, um, the life and the teaching and the resurrection of Jesus, uh, pulling together evidences of the, you know, of the testimony um, that the gospel is true, that the gospels are true, that the New Testament is true, that the Bible is true, all that in the field of apologetics, making good sound argument for the foundations of what we believe. So um, plenty of room for that good work to take place. In preparation for today's message, I have been reading C.S. Lewis's little classic miracles. And it is a little classic and it is stock full. I, um, I would love to be able to talk through any of you who want to read through uh, miracles this summer. I'd be happy to talk through the book. It is, um, it's a, a powerful witness and testimony to the miracles. But here's, here's C.S. Lewis. He is an Oxford Don, and it's clear that he is addressing a culture that is especially allergic to miracles, the modern academy. Wherever these perspectives hold sway, okay, naturalism, materialism, rationalism, scientism, secularism, miracles don't fit because those, those philosophies, those worldviews make a claim about what can be known, what can be real, what actually exists, and miracles don't fit inside that box. So they're denied. Now, this isn't a philosophy class, so I can't take the time to debunk these ideologies, but Lewis does brilliantly in this little book. So um, apologetics, I'm gonna say this, when I, was, um, when I was in my college years and seminary years, apologetics was a bigger theme and interest than it is right now in Christianity and culture. It, there were lots of books on apologetics and we read things and argued a lot. But over the years of my work in ministry, I'm sad to report to you, 
that I have never argued a person into the kingdom, okay? I think there's a place and there's a need for this good work to happen and for us to learn a defense of the faith, the, you know, the, the kind of reasons why we believe. But in my effort to convince someone else by argument, evidence, and persu persuasion, I've always fallen short. And I think that's because very few people actually come to faith because they're convinced. I think they come to faith by the way that it happened for all of us, by the fabulous, miraculous working of God's Spirit in our heart, in our lives. And so Lewis knows this. Well, the Apostle Paul knew this too. The Apostle Paul is a brilliant apologist, but he uses it hand in hand, married to He's a brilliant evangelist as well, and his apologetics set the stage for his bright witness, for him to give testimony to who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And so, same thing with C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, so Luke is doing some work through Lewis books with, uh, with Youth This Summer, and uh, Mere Christianity is kind of um, apologetics work that, that Lewis is doing, making some argumentation about belief in Christ, lovely book. And then he's gonna jump on working with another group through the screw tape letters, imagination, you know, engaging people in a little bit of uh, curiosity and wonder. Most of the stuff that C.S. Lewis writes isn't actually apologetics, right? It's fantasy work. It's wonder-making work. I think that there is a, a little lesson here that most people don't come to faith because you've persuaded them. They come to faith because you've opened up a world of wonder. And so when I share my testimony, when I, and when you share, your, it is, oh, wait, is, the, is that really possible? Is the world really like that? Is it possible that there is this kind of love, this kind of forgiveness that is alive and available? You've got to ignite wonder in the listener. Okay, so we're going to come, uh, come back to that here in, in a little bit. Um, so apologetics as a stepping stone. Right now, I want to remind you of this, that um, every human being is a believer. Okay? Now, when we use the phrase believer, we often kind of mean it like this. We mean, you know, believe it, a, a Christian believer, believer, you know, a believer in, you know, the reality and the lordship of Jesus Christ, that's a believer. What I mean by this is that, hey, every person has um, a life that is at some point rooted and anchored in beliefs. Nobody can test or prove or measure everything. They have some fundamental beliefs that anchor and frame their life. Every person has beliefs, and that's because as Christians we know this, being made, created in the very image and likeness of God, we were made to believe. We were made to be in relationship with the God who lives and reigns, and we were meant to live in service of the one who is infinite, eternal, sublime spirit. So we were made to live in wonder in faith, believing and living that out naturally was a life of wonder and faithfulness. It's only when sin enters the world that instead of wonder, people who are full of wonder, we become wanderers, right? We wander from the faith. We wander from the God who's made us. We do our own things. We're lost all along the path, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the one I love. Human beings were made to be pistic beings, faith beings, and it's inescapable still. We place our faith somewhere, in something, in someone. We can't help it. We were born to wonder, not wander. Born to wonder. It's the wandering that leads us astray. After sin has come into the world, we wander and then we anchor those beliefs in idols and not in the true and living God. So yes, apologetics can be helpful in getting, um, reminding people that there is this path, but it's the path of wonder. It's the path of service of the one living and true God. We're trying to guide people back to that path. Now, people as believers, I want to um, explore a little, uh, little sociology of our culture. What is it that people actually believe? Maybe you guys don't realize this, that... Um, you know, Pastor Bill is away, you know, he and Amy are away right now that they're off at a, um, you know, a, a, special, a special retreat center where, um, 
where it's a, a, a Bigfoot uh, conference. And um, <laughs> actually, actually, there is a big Bigfoot conference this weekend that you could go to. Um, now, many of the people, I'm assuming that many of the people there are there because they think it's hilarious and funny. But I think Luke is a believer. He was confessing earlier. I think, I think Luke is a big Bigfoot believer. And, uh, but what percentage of the American, um, adult American population do you think believe in Bigfoot? Believe that, you know, Bigfoots are roaming the land. What, what would you think it is? It's 13% and rising. So Bigfoot is on the move, and this is great fun for people who are campers, and it's great for, you know, campfire stories. How about this one? The percentage of adult Americans who believe that Loch Ness Monster is real. No, that's too high. Eight to nine percent. Okay, so, so we've got some people who believe in, you know, because this is too much Jeremy Wade and his river monsters in our culture, I think. You know, people prone to believe in these, you know, these hidden giant beasts. So eight or nine percent, that's been pretty steady over the decades. Bigfoot on the rise at 13. Um, so how about, um, how about this? Which do you think is going to be higher? Those who believe in UFOs or aliens? This is a tricky one, right? It seems to me like it should be aliens should be bigger because there could be aliens that don't have UFOs, but can there be UFOs without aliens? It doesn't seem like that. So there could be, and actually the number of those people in adult Americans who believe in aliens, including my sister apparently because we were kayaking on Moraine yesterday and she confessed to believing in aliens and so on, uh, 65%. Wow. Okay, so including Billy Graham, by the way. So, you know, in some good company, people who believe that there is life elsewhere, alien life. How about the, the percentage that believe in UFOs? It's not as high as 65. 40%. With a full 10% of adult Americans claiming to have seen one. Including my next door neighbors when I was a kid. I was good friends with Mike, my next door neighbor. And one time his parents sat Mike and I down and they were terrified and they began to tell us about their encounter of UFO, not seeing one in the sky, but one landed in a field. And clearly they were terrified and we were 11 years old. And so, yes, naturally we were a little terrified, not about aliens, but about the parenting skills of, you know, Mike's mom and dad. Like, what are they doing sharing belief in aliens with 11-year-olds? You know, like, holy mackerel. So anything you think, yeah, D Don, he's all messed up. It goes back to that event when I was a kid, all right? Okay, how about, how about percentage that believe in ghosts? This is a weird, tricky one. 36%, but most of them know that Ghostbusters was make-believe. How about believe in heaven and hell? Two different things. Heaven's a little higher than belief in 70% and 60%, okay? Believe in angels. 80%. Apparently some of them don't have any place to live, okay? Um, how about miracles now? Percentage of adult Americans who believe in miracles is 80%. And one third claim to have witnessed one. Okay, the Gospels report, of course, that Jesus performed 37 miracles or so, give or take, and that doesn't include the, our rich redemptive history that is full, like I already said, you know, from the creation and through Exodus and um, through the apostles, the, you know, the prophets and the apostles, the grand miracles of incarnation, resurrection, Pentecost, we'll return to all these. The story of redemption is thick with miracles, and so apparently there is something about the role of the church even, you know, receding a little bit as it is in our, in our time and our day that has shaped a culture of at least a readiness to believe in some of these things. So, how about this one then? Belief in God. That one has held steady at about 86% for decades until the last five years. And it's dropped down to 80%. That's actually, for this kind of data, that's actually a pretty alarming change in that amount of time. So there's something interesting to explore there about this shift in our culture. But it's, uh, to be a little realistic about this, that's only when you ask the question about believing God without saying anything else about, as soon as you begin to describe the God of the Bible, 
that number drops down from 80 down into the 60s, and if you're a little more specific, even into the 50s. So, so don't take that as the data that proves that everyone's really a Christian believer. That's not exactly how this data works, right? So um, just an openness to believe in God at 80%. The resurrection, two-thirds of Americans, adult Americans, believe in the resurrection. That's, um, that's even more than believe in the God of the Bible. And so that must be something about the success of our, our Easter holiday, right? You know, that, that, pe that people are ready to believe in the resurrection who don't even believe in the biblical God or in the incarnation. Okay, so I'm not sure for you guys where you want to draw the line because we, um, we, I think we know this. We can't just believe every crazy thing we hear, right? We, so the, there's the need for some kind of discernment. Not every crazy thing I hear do I take to be true. And um, so we can't either be that, nor can we disbelieve everything that cannot be sensed, measured, or proven. Right? That's a, that's a kind of a worldview to that only things that I can, because even that those are the only things I'm going to believe can't be tested, measured, or proven. That's just a belief that I have, that only those things are true. So we've got this issue where, hey, we can't believe everything, uh, but we've got to believe something. Everyone believes in some things. And so here I find myself in this position, and, and here's how I'm trying to frame this. I want to be the kind of Christian, I think you do too, who is discerning and wise, not believing just anything, but I also want to be the kind of Christian who is humble and human, knowing my place as a finite, pistic being. In other words, I'm finite. I'm not gonna, I don't know everything, right? I know that I'm not going to know. I know that it's impossible. Only God can know everything, and only God can know things perfectly. I know things as a human being, finite as I am, and actually as a fallen human being, sinful as I am. I know things imperfectly. So I always want to bring with me a kind of humility, but I know that because I'm a pistic being, I am going to believe. And so I want to get my beliefs as clear and as right as I possibly can. That's part of the role of apologetics. That's also part of the role of the Christian church. We begin like iron, you know, iron sharpens iron. We begin to work and talk together so that we're beginning to forge faithfulness that our beliefs are well anchored, well justified, but that there's going to be some variation. You know, some people are, you know, are going to be big footers and the rest of us are not. Okay, that's, you know, maybe going to be the, the reality there. Uh, okay, so um, I, I'm, I'm ex setting up our theme, you know, our apologetics theme and thinking about believing, but really I'm late in the sermon, so I need to get to the Bible because this is a sermon after all. And so I'm going to ask you, if you want to, to turn to, um, turn to Acts chapter 3. And, um, but let me set this up a little bit for you because, um, because Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, is writing for Theophilus, whose name means beloved by God. That's kind of cool. But it's not just for Theophilus, it's for all of us, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And there's this nice little overlap where Acts goes back to recap a couple things right at the end of the book of Acts like this. The resurrection is the miracle that's at the center of history and the center of the cosmic transformation that the Lord is bringing about. Fantastic. So we're going to start right out in the book of Acts, celebrating the miracle of the resurrection. But then pretty quickly, it's going to, Luke is going to, hey, we've, we've done that work already. But get this, okay, Jesus ascends and so, in, so the resurrection is a bodily resurrection, the ascension, a bodily ascension that the Lord Jesus incarnate still at the right hand of the Father, interceding for, it's fabulous, miraculous stuff, right? That, that nature itself doesn't work this way, but God is working this way. The ascended Lord Jesus ascends and then pours out his Holy Spirit at, at Pentecost. So the, the, um, the disciples and others are in their hideout, that upper room in Jerusalem, and there are 120 of them gathered there. 
and the Holy Spirit pours out and there's a rushing of wind and their heads catch on fire and they're, you know, and they begin to speak in tongues of other languages and they leave the upper room and other people of all the tribes and nations are hearing the gospel in their own language. It's spectacular, the miracle of Pentecost that's taking place there at the birth of the church. And then, and I'm not sure I'd count this as a miracle, but it's way cool, the nature of that church. You know, that church becomes the church that is dedicated to the teaching of the apostles. They become dedicated to fellowshipping together. They share everything that they have for the, you know, the, the vulnerable, the hungry, and the needy. The church is lit up. And so it's gorgeous, this response to the gospel. Now, Peter, Acts 2, is going to go out and um, he's going to preach a pretty darn good sermon. Okay. And I'm not going to count this as a miracle either because Peter, um, Peter had gifts. He had skills. And he knew the redemptive history. He had spent life and time with Jesus. And he's preaching his heart out. And it's got some great connections to the Old Testament. But he's exalting Jesus. And, um, and then that day, because of, is it because of his preaching? 3,000 people that day come to faith because of the mighty work of the Holy Spirit. So there is this miracle, you know, there's Peter doing his calling, his job, and then the miraculous work of the Spirit and the, one, the flaming 120 become 3,000, and then each day more and more are being added to that number. We've got this spectacular upheaval in Jerusalem that's taking place, okay? Way, way very cool. And so that's when we come to, um, th to this text in... Um, the first 10 verses of, um, of Acts chapter 3. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon, and now a man was lame from birth, and he was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, because it was beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money, and Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, Hey, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And so Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them to the, into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. All right. Lame from birth. Just recapping this, because this is just a great little 10 verses here. The man was lame from birth, lifelong disability. And he's not merely healed, but he's transformed. God works something on the outside, but something on the inside of this one who is healed. And I love it, you know, Peter with John at his side, um, hey, hey, look at us. Do we look like the kind of people who are toting around silver and gold? You know, do, do we look like the kind of people who are among the rich? But we do have something, something for you. And his name is Jesus. All right, so they've got this gift and it's the faith and it's the forgiveness and it's the power of Christ that is poured out. And immediately, the man is made strong. I think God is showing off here a little bit. Like it could have been that it took a while and that he was okay, he could walk at least. But no, it's like immediate and totally strong and leaping. You know, like that's the, the, the miracle emphasis here. His response, leaping, walking, praising, and it's seen by all. And then the crowd's response was what? Do you remember? Last line, wonder and amazement. They're filled with wonder and amazement. And so, guys, I'm wondering this. The last time, when was the last time you were filled with wonder and amazement? And I know the answer. It's been too long. It's been too long. All right, so um, because I'm a theist and I'm a Trinitarian, 
and because I've wrestled with and come to believe in the miracle of the incarnation and of the resurrection, as well as the mystery of substitutionary atonement, I believe in God embodied as Jesus Christ who performed miracles of various kinds. And since Jesus' teaching start to finish, day after day, parable after parable, focuses on the kingdom. And then I read and then I see that, wait, these miracles are signs of the kingdom. I can see what Jesus is up to. That on the lips of Jesus, it's always the gospel of the kingdom. I've got a grand restoration. It's not just about the salvation of souls. It's the salvation of whole people. It's the salvation of an entire creation. This gospel of Jesus is huge and embracing and beautiful. And so that's the, I've got this assurance then that, wait, this Jesus come by miracle, raised by miracle, ascends by miracle, works through miracles. By his Holy Spirit miraculously poured out, the apostles are performing miracles right there in Acts 3. I believe in divine intervention. God's intervention in his church to drive his mission forward. So I believe that Peter and others were vehicles of God's spirit in dispatching miracles. Now I want to tell you this, that among the good and faithful friends and some people perhaps gathered here and good church people have um, developed a kind of a, a reading that where they don't think that miracles continue to be viable expressions of God's presence in the modern day. That miracles were only practiced by the apostles, by Jesus and then the apostles as a confirmation of the message that they were delivering. Confer you know, once that gospel is clearly established, once the, um, once the scriptural testimony is, uh, is set loose, that God now works by rational means, by means of the text and by means of preaching and proclamation of the word, relational work. And it is true that so much of Western history and church history has been propelled forward by real people, not performing miracles, but doing ministry, right? I, that's true. I just don't happen to buy the argument that the Bible teaches that, no, that, that the uh, miraculous age ended with the apostolic age. I think it's clear that there are miracles that are still happening beyond the apostles, okay? So um, some people believe that the miracles were restricted to that time. I'm not so sure about that. I try to, this is just as, as I try to make sense of these things, I try to let God's revelation in his word become as best I can my frame of reference, okay? I try to develop a Christian perspective, a Christian worldview regarding who God is, what God is up to, what it means for me to be a human being, what's possible, what's good and right and true. So for me, like reflecting back on our text here in Acts, I want to be one of the ones who, for example, would have come to faith upon hearing the gospel with Peter's epic, uh, epic sermon that day. I would want to be a kind of person who is open enough, like I, I, I don't believe that I know everything, that I'm all locked down, that I'm going to be statically controlling an only, I want to be one who could be wowed by the story of God's outrageous love being poured out in history in this way, right? I want to have a worldview that remains open enough to this kind of work of God. I wish that I could be a person, I don't know that I would have been, I wish I could be a person that would have responded with the total life commitment that we saw there in that early church. You know, that, that the response of having heard this good news and this spirit given and witnessing these miracles, that I would become completely and totally sold out. And this is a hard one for us in our day, in our culture, because there are so many things where we've shaped a life in a culture where achievement matters, individualism matters, accomplishment matters, and we begin to collect and accumulate and we care, we take care of ourselves and those that we love. That's our culture. There's something about this vision of the church, this expression of the early, early church that explodes that that is lovelier, richer, deeper, more full of faith and generosity than can even be imagined. So I'm going to have to set that one aside for a whole other sermon. I just, it's just my conviction is this, that idols continue to work in our own day, in our own culture, and that the shadow of idol, idols lays over the church as well, that we've still got a lot of growing up to do, a lot of uh, trust and engagement work to do, 
Okay, set that aside for a sec. That's a tough one. But if I was there by the beautiful gate, I'd like to picture myself as running and leaping with the one healed. Right, just running and leaping, uncorked. Like the recognition that what God is at work here. This is spectacular. And he is praising God, and I want to be the one who could join right in with him. In a world of wonder, we must be willing to be uncorked with joy. And so that, this reminds me, and I'll come back to this in the benediction. This reminds me of a, a very, this is the very last chapter in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. Just the first two verses for now. Well, I think I, I think I can flip to it, actually. Mm, yes, I can. Nope. There it is. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Thank you for your patience. Okay, surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. So there is a coming day of judgment. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. You'll go leaping out of the stall, most of the other translations say. I love that leaping expression there that this work of the Lord is so wondrous, so wonderful that you become uncorked like a calf fresh out of the stall, leaping with joy. So, um, so that's, I, I wish that I could be that, you know, in that frame. And so, yes, I'm open to miracles, open and discerning. And like you, um, I've seen some shady actors who claim divine power. And so I'm a little reticent when I see today's Elmer Gantries. And yeah, that's another movie reference that goes way back to a, a conniving, a, a, a conniving uh, evangelist. Um, but we do see today's Elmer Gantries because there's so much hype and hysteria and hucksterism. So, yeah. And I don't believe every claim, even if it's a Christian claim, especially not the claim that, um, that all you need is total faith and then healing is automatic. And I've heard that preached and proclaimed at healing services and in messages so many times to the great pain and hurt of people who have been disabled lifelong and done nothing but pray relentlessly to be healed, and it hasn't happened. So I think we need to take great care, not to overpromise. I think miracles are, are possible, but I don't think there's like some kind of formula that we're leveraging God to make them happen. I've heard bogus claims, and I've seen pretend miracles, and so most of you have as well. But I'm open. I'm open to the special manifestation of the spiritual gifts. Okay, I think that the Bible takes those seriously, but I don't over-elevate them, and neither did the Apostle Paul. He kind of tries to put them in their place and recognizes that there's all kinds of gifts that have already been distributed. We all need to discern and use the gifts that we've been given and that the Lord can provide additional gifts along the way when the need arises. But yes, we need to live more independence of all the gifts that the, that the Lord provides. I'm quite confident that there's a whole range of gifts right here. I'm pretty confident that modern-day claims of uh, apostleship are spurious and that claims of modern-day prophecy can be dangerous. So I do think that as I, as I take stock of what's happening in the broader church, yes, there's excesses that, w that we're going to need to be concerned about. We're going to need to be discerning and wise about how we, how we um, discern the Word. I believe in um, demons and angels and I'm largely content not to meet any, okay? Because I've seen, you know, in the, in the biblical stories what, that, what that's like and what that leads to. It's hard. I believe in the ongoing work of Jesus and in his church through the Holy Spirit, and I pray for it. I pray for that. Ghosts and aliens and Loch Ness and Bigfoot, well, just call me Doubting Thomas on those things. But I do love to hear the stories of people that claim that they've experienced or seen strange things. Many of us have outliers in our own lives. Things that we may not count as miracles, but things that we can't quite explain. 
once you develop the trust, you can begin to talk to, it's amazing how many people in their lives, you know, you've got your, your regular rational everyday consciousness, you know, you wake up in the morning and you've got things to do, you've got an agenda. And so what am I gonna have for breakfast? What am I gonna wear today? What's, you know, what, what's the day? We fall so quickly into our rational everyday consciousness, but every once in a while something happens that defies my little box, my, you know, and it's weird, it's unexplainable. I think that actually happens. I try to give people a listening ear to hear stories like that because here's what I want. I want them to ask me, hey, has anything ever happened to you that um, defies explanation? And by the way, there are a couple weird things that have happened to me that defy, but there's one that I take to be, to be the transformative event of my life. And I was in eighth grade and I was very marginally schooled right here in this church through flannel graphs and some things, you know, to understand enough about the gospel that on September 22nd, in the middle of the night, I had an encounter with the living Jesus. And I know that he was real. I know that the forgiveness was real. I know that the relationship that was established then and has continued to this day was, it was a complete outlier. It was completely outside my box of my life but that the Lord Jesus met me that night. And that changed everything. And it took me some years to make sense of this, you know, this dramatic, this life-changing um, experience. But for me, um, I just, I want to give other people ear so that I have opportunity to share, hey, I've got a story too. This is something that has happened in my life. So yep, I'm open to divine surprises. Open, ready, and waiting. I think that's the posture of faith, to have a worldview that is open, but not with gaping naivete, that it has room for miracles, but it's not a wash in them, because I think God loves his well-ordered creation, okay? He loves it, and so the normal frame of things doesn't involve miracles, but he's also willing to engage that creation, to give it a little nudge now and then, and I think we need to keep our eyes open and be alert to those very things. So upon witnessing the miracle in Acts 3, the disciples and those gathered at the beautiful gate, they were filled with wonder and amazement. I hope never to lose my wonder and amazement. Each Christmas, when we celebrate the incarnation, every Easter, celebrating the resurrection, every time I read of the miraculous kingdom miracles that are the signs of Lord Jesus, and it's coming rain. And at the signs of God's ongoing work for the sake of the church. Wonder and amazement. Like little children, we were made for these. So please pray with me. Lord, Lord, we do pray that we'd be the kind of people who, um, who believe deeply and rightly. Who can be discerning and wise, but also... Um, open and full of wonder. We don't want to close off your reality, your work in the world, um, but we don't want to be hooked and led too easily astray. So Lord, help us as a church to work together in discerning ways, to mature in the faith, to seek and long for your presence, the work of your spirit in our own lives. We thank you for um, this word, for this message, for this hope for our opportunity to come together to exalt and to worship you. And even now, as we um, confess our faith together, unite us together by your perfect love that has been poured out um, in your spirit for your church. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And let's rise now and confess together our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together.
light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Receive the benediction. May the beaming sun of God's righteousness shine upon you. May his healing and his love fill you up, fill you to the point that you are leaping with joy. In his name we pray, amen. Go in peace.